who should be the next governor of Kansas. What's going on in Topeka is just outrageous. I know state government inside and out. Being an independent really liberates me to serve Kansans in ways that no other governor can. Before you vote, experience the candidates for yourself. From the Doubletree Hotel in Overland Park, it's the Kansas Governor's Debate, presented by the Johnson County Bar Association. 1,400 members serving the community since 1938. And now here's your debate moderator from Kansas City Public Television, Nick Haynes. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. This hour we are conducting a job interview. It is for a position that pays $99,000 a year. Yes, there are benefits, including a chauffeur-driven car and a mansion overlooking the Kansas River. But I'm told by the Kansas Historical Association it is actually the smallest government's residence anywhere uh, in the country. That being said, it is rent-free. Now, with privilege, though, comes responsibility. How about carrying on your shoulders every single day the hopes and dreams, the happiness and well-being of nearly three million people? So who is best equipped to take on that leadership role? Is it the state's chief elections officer, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach? He is the Republican candidate. Or is it the state senator from Topeka, Laura Kelly? She's the Democratic nominee in this race. Or is it Greg Orman, who is waging an independent campaign for Kansas governor? He is a Johnson County businessman and former United States Senate candidate. Now, when Sam Brownback uh, announced in January he would be leaving Kansas to become the nation's ambassador for religious freedom, there was a lot of people who looked in the mirror and saw the next governor of Kansas staring back at them. Why do you believe you are the most uniquely qualified person to be the governor of Kansas, Laura Kelly? Well, you know, I came to Kansas 32 years ago. Uh, we made the decision to move here. I grew up in a military family, moved all over the world, and so when my husband and I had our first child, we really wanted to establish some very deep roots. Uh, and we saw Kansas as the place to do that. There were good jobs available, a very strong sense of community, and terrific public schools. And my daughters both got a world-class education in our schools because of them and the teachers. And I'm running for governor because I want to make sure that every child, no matter who they are or where they live, have the same opportunities to succeed that my daughters did. Chris Kobach. You know, I think uh, talk is cheap in politics. Po politicians are always making promises and saying they'll do this or that, uh, but results are something different, and I've shown the people of Kansas that I deliver results. As Secretary of State, I promised we'd have photo ID, proof of citizenship, and I'd cut the size of my, my office, and I delivered on all three promises. Now, you may not personally agree with me on all three, but you can see by my actions that if I make a promise, I'll put my head down and I'll push as hard as I can to deliver on the promise. And so as governor, I'm gonna be promising uh, to cut taxes and spending, which was the missing ingredient of the Brownback tax cuts of 2012, and we will reduce our tax rate in Kansas, especially our property taxes, which will have, if I'm governor, a 2% cap on appraisals. We are overtaxed. We're the high tax state in the five state area. I'll deliver on that promise. And as far as cutting spending goes, I cut my budget from 7.0 million down to 4.6 million. Thank you very much. Greg Ullman. Well, normally I'd say it's nice to see so many familiar faces, but <laughs> considering the crowd. Um, William Allen White, the famed Emporia Gazette editor, once said, when anything's going to happen in America, it happens first in Kansas. Kansas used to lead. It used to be a place that other states looked to for inspiration. Uh, now we're a cautionary tale. And frankly, both parties are to blame. Uh, we've had two decades of decline in Kansas. Median household income actually peaked in 2003, the first year Kathleen Sebelius took office. Health outcomes in Kansas have gone from number eight in the nation in 1991 to 27 uh, today, and our kids have been leaving the state for greener pastures for decades. Uh, both parties have had an opportunity to solve this. Both parties have had the opportunity to put Kansas on the right track, and they have failed. I believe my business background, my experience running and managing large organizations uniquely qualifies me to be governor, and I hope to be able to explain that today. Thank you very much. As you travel the state and talk to Kansans, what is the number one issue they tell you they're worried about, and how, in 60 seconds or less, Laura Kelly, do you plan on fixing it? 
I think there are three major issues that I'm hearing from constituents. Obviously, education is number one, uh, but also our infrastructure, whether it's roads or broadband, the second. And then thirdly, uh, it's health care. They want Medicaid expansion. They want it now. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, when I'm governor, I'll make sure that we can do. We've had to cut all of those kinds of things because of the Brownback tax experiment uh, that really took our state uh, down a road of devastation, whether you're looking at our roads, our health care, our economy. We need to reverse that, and that's what I'll do as governor. Chris Kobach. Uh, without question, the number one thing I hear about is taxes. Like I said, we're the high tax state, the five state area. Uh, we had a record-breaking sales tax hike in 2015, and I'm sure you all see that when you go to make purchases, and a record-breaking income tax hike in 2017. The combined impact of those two tax hikes on the average Johnson County household is $1,244 a year. $1,244 a year out of your wallet, in addition to the previous taxes you were paying. That's a family vacation. That's food on the table. That's all kinds of things that could be used for your households. And Topeka is not managing the money like we would manage our money in a law firm or manage our money in a household. Instead, the spending just keeps going and going and going. And I'll agree, under Republicans and Democrats administration, the spending has just been going like this. I will rein in spending. Topeka doesn't have a, a revenue problem. It has a spending problem. And I will solve that problem. Greg Ullman. You, you know, I travel the state, and I, I clearly hear issues like public education, health care, um, those are clearly things on people's mind. But at the end of the day, Kansas faces a demographic challenge. You know, our state is aging. Our kids are leaving the state. If we are going to be able to create the jobs and opportunities that keep our kids here and have the resources to invest in infrastructure, to invest in public education, to invest in health care, we have to grow the Kansas economy. What we have had historically has been a series of tactics. What we need is a proactive economic development strategy. Uh, and that's one of the things that we have highlighted as our number one priority. Uh, we've got it on our website. It's available. We have a very detailed plan that focuses on leveraging our strengths, overcoming obstacles to economic development, developing our workforce, and ultimately addressing our reputational deficit so that we can get people to move to Kansas. The debate rules allow you 30 seconds to rebut. Would you like to have that 30 seconds, Laura Kelly? I, I would. You know, I agree that the economy needs to grow, but what we look at is what happened over these past eight years to, to make it stop growing. Uh, it was cutting our education system, it was cutting our roads and transportation system, and it was not expanding Medicaid. Those are the kinds of things that we've got to do if we're ever going to grow this economy. Uh, we took away the bioscience authority, which was probably the best economic tool Kansas ever had in place. We did that to pay for the tax plan. Chris Kobach. If, if you like the Keynesian idea of just have the government spend, 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 and hope that that creates a secondary effect in the private sector, then, then I'm not your man. You would want a, a big spending candidate, and, and one of the others would be a perfect choice for you. But if you think businesses are driven by the bottom line, and that is the amount of taxes they pay and the utility rates they pay, I will try to get both below. We are also the high utility rate uh, state in the four, five state area, 13.4 cents per kilowatt hour here, 10.9 average around us. How are you going to get a business to come here when our taxes are the highest and our utility Thank rates you very much, highest? Greg Ullman. Well, you know, the state of Kansas is a $16 billion enterprise. It touches the lives of hundreds of thousands of people every day. Uh, there are over 17,000 employees working directly for the state of Kansas. I'm the only candidate on stage who's actually ever gotten better performance out of large, oftentimes very efficient organizations, uh, and I can do that. I know Secretary Kobach talked about cutting his budget. The reality is 75% of those cuts came from a federal grant that expired. The next question goes to you, first of all, Mr. Kobach. Johnson County Bar Association member Catherine in Kansas City wants to know, should judges play a role in how much money is spent on Kansas school children? Do you support a proposed constitutional amendment that would give the legislature exclusive authority to determine what is adequate funding in our public schools? 
Uh, yes, I support such a constitutional amendment. We have a constitutional crisis right now in Kansas. The judiciary has assumed the appropriations power, which the Kansas Constitution in Article 2, Section 24 very clearly gives only to the legislature. The judiciary is now in decision after decision saying, no, this amount of money is not enough. Spend this amount of money. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 78, I'm sure many of you remember this from constitutional law, he said that we need not fear the judiciary because it has neither the power of the sword nor the power of the purse. The Kansas Supreme Court has seized the power of the purse. It is outside of its constitutional role. So that is one constitutional problem we have and needs to be corrected. The second is it's absolutely butchering Article 6, Section 6 of the Kansas Constitution, which says the legislature shall make suitable provision for the funding of schools so that no child needs to pay tuition to attend a public school. That is an almost an exact paraphrase. It doesn't say each child gets an adequate or super adequate amount of money. The Kansas Supreme Court is out of its lane and has misinterpreted the Constitution. That must end. Laura Kelly. Uh, no, I do not believe that we need a constitutional amendment. The people in the state of Kansas uh, made it very clear when they included it in the Constitution that we needed to provide suitable education for our kids. Uh, and the court just upheld that ruling. They did not appropriate the funding. The legislature appropriated the funding. We appropriated enough funding this past year to nearly pass court muster. We do need to come back and deal with the rate of inflation. Uh, because we overturned the Brownback tax plan, we now have the funds in the kitty uh, to be able to take care of that in January when we get back in the legislature. Greg Ullman. You know, I think it's helpful that the Supreme Court flagged this issue for us. Ultimately, it's up to the legislature and the governor to provide for suitable education. I don't think it makes sense to have a constitutional amendment while we're in the middle of a lawsuit. But I think the bigger issue here that we're facing is as it relates to education, we're coming at it from answers driven by two failed playbooks. You know, I hear from many on the far right, we need to go to private school vouchers. You know, there's one private high school west of Wichita. How does a private school voucher solve a problem for a kid in Colby, Kansas? On the other side, we hear we need to pour hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars into the top of the funnel. I want to do what a business person would do. I want to focus on the root cause of the problem. And ultimately, and my wife's a public school teacher, I support public schools, you know, she said something to me that made a whole lot of sense, and that is the best education policy is a growing economy. If we grow our economy, we're going to have the ability uh, to provide for public education in a suitable way without increasing taxes. You have 30 seconds to rebut, Mr. Kobach. Uh, yeah, I'd like to rebut what uh, Greg said previously about uh, my budget. Uh, we did reduce it 7.0 million to 4.6 million. He repeated a talking point of one of my former Republican opponents, so he can be forgiven for uh, his source. Uh, but the HAVA funds uh, that he's talking about, they didn't, they're not empty. We still had two about two and a half million dollars in that fund, and that wasn't forcing us to cut our budget. And we just got another three million, almost four million from the federal government. So the federal fund is still there. We cut the budget by me cutting staff through gradual attrition. When baby boomers retire, we didn't replace them. Thank you, Laura Kelly. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I hear Chris t say over and over, all we need to do is cut and, and things will be fine in the state of Kansas. And we can cut taxes, we can cut programs. What I've never heard him tell us is exactly what he would cut. Are we going to cut schools? Are we going to cut foster care? Are we going to cut roads? What are you going to cut, Chris, to pay for your tax cut? Greg Woolman. You know, again, getting back on the issue of public education, it's the only manufacturing process I know of where you don't control the quality of your inputs. What happens to that kid at night, on the weekends? Do they have to work till 2 in the morning to help support their family? Do their, do their parents have multiple jobs? Uh, those are the things we have to get at. We have to grow the Kansas economy. We have to be able to allow the private sector to create great jobs for people so that they can get more engaged in their kids' education and we can have better outcomes. Let's, start, let's pick up on a question that uh, Laura Kelly just asked. State government runs a lot of programs and services. Which one is so good that it deserves more money and which one performs so poorly it deserves to be eliminated, and that starts with you, Greg Woolman. Well, you know, I think what we've seen through the Brownback years is that there are a lot of areas of state government where we've lost resources. So you could go at, at DCF as an example and say, clearly we need more social workers, we shouldn't be taking so many kids out of the home, uh, we should be working to keep families together. But, you know, look, right here in Johnson County, we have a prime example of government waste. Uh, through the PEAK program, we pay to move companies from one side of State Line Road to the other. The Hall Family Foundation did an analysis and said it was $301,000 was what it cost for every job created right here in Johnson County. I talked to Jerry Lopez, the CEO of AMC Theaters at the time they moved 
from Kansas City, Missouri to Leewood. He said, Greg, it's stupid public policy, but I'd be stupid not to take the $45 million. You never mentioned a program or service to eliminate. Well, again, it would be the peak program okay, very in, good. in the Kansas City area. I Chris, draw no fly That's great. Zone. Thank you. Chris yeah. Kobach. Uh, the program that I would, uh, that is the best is our highways. We're actually number two in the nation in the quality of our highways. Um, now, we have been robbing from the highway fund year after year after year to balance the budget and finance the legislature's uh, big spending habits. Uh, but we absolutely need to finish the T-Works program and finish building out the roads. That is a program that's doing very well. And you see it when you cross the line into Missouri or Nebraska. You see the, the roads get worse when you cross the state line. Um, the program, the spending that I would eliminate is giving in-state tuition subsidies to illegal aliens, which we've been doing since 2004, and uh, which Ms. Kelly voted for in the, in the legislature, or voted against repealing uh, in the legislature. Uh, that's, depending on the year, between three and four million dollars we're spending to subsidize the education, the secondary the, post, uh, the, the graduate education in, in college of people who cannot legally work in the state of Kansas. If we have so much money to be subsidizing education, let's not hike tuition at KU or K-State this year. Laura Kelly. Uh, thank you. I, I think some of the things that we actually do well in the state of Kansas, and we can do better, uh, is career and technical education. We really did some serious reforms in that over the past few years, and I think we've seen a great increase in the number of kids taking full advantage of that. Uh, we had at one time a very robust early childhood education program. We've cut that back somewhat. We need to expand that again because that's the best investment uh, that the state can make. You know, and I think about what we could actually cut. Uh, I don't know, I might combine the barber and uh, cosmetology programs uh, and uh, save a half a position on that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have cut so much over the past eight years, there really is no nowhere else to go. If anything, what we're seeing, even with the current administration, is the need to put people back in place to provide the basic core services that government's responsible for. Greg Ullman, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, I think the idea that we have nowhere else to go is, is just based on someone who's never actually worked in the private sector before or had to manage large budgets. You know, the reality is our criminal justice system, we waste so much money uh, arresting, incarcerating uh, kids for buying dime bags of wheat. There's, there's opportunity to cut, there's opportunity to save across the board. As it relates to in-state tuition, 670 kids got in-state tuition last year. The idea that that somehow cost us money, it would have left empty seats, we wouldn't have gotten the revenue. Uh, again, I think Thank Penny you very much. Foolish. Chris Kobach. Every in-state tuition payer gets a, has two-thirds of the weight, two-thirds of the freight paid by you, the taxpayer, pays one-third of it himself. Um, the idea that there's nothing left to cut is ridiculous. Kansas is number three in America, number three in the number of state and local government employees per capita. There is a lot of fat to cut on government in Kansas. And I did that in my agency by simply gradual attrition. As, as the baby boomers retire, and they're retiring 11,000 a day nationally, if they're in government, see if we can get by without filling the position. Laura Kelly, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, the state government has shrunk considerably over the past eight years. When, when Chris talks about local government being expanded, he's really talking at the very local level, whether you're talking school districts and cities and townships and those kinds. State government itself has shrunk considerably to the point where we're not able to provide basic services for our citizens. Chris Kobach touched on this in his last answer. Let's delve into it now, beginning with you, Laura Kelly. What role, if any, should the state of Kansas play in immigration policy? Should children brought here illegally but who graduate from a Kansas high school be eligible for in-state tuition? I have voted for that, and I'll vote for it again if I need to. Uh, those kids have been living in the state of Kansas is the only home they know. They've been attending high schools for at least three years. They've graduated. They're eligible for entrance into our region's universities. Uh, and all we're giving them is total rack rate. They don't, they don't, not eligible for any grants, uh, not eligible for any scholarships. They pay full tuition. And when Chris says that we could save $3 million by charging them out-of-state tuition, that's not true. Those kids would be dropping out of college because they couldn't afford it. We would actually be losing $14 million in tuition revenue. Greg Ullman. You know, I, I think, again, this, this idea of immigration reform clearly is a federal issue. When I was running for the U.S. Senate, I said we need an Im immigration plan that's tough, practical, and fair. By tough, I mean we need to secure the borders. Obviously, we need secure borders. 
By practical, we're not going to find and deport 11 million people, nor would it be economically advisable. Western Kansas would be decimated. Two out of three dairies would close. Two out of three feed yards would close. So how do we make it fair to taxpayers? I believe if you're here on an undocumented basis, you should have to register with ICE by a date certain. You should have to pay a small fine or perform community services in acknowledgement that you've broken a law. But then if you hold down a job, you pay your taxes, you obey our laws, you should be able to stay here and work. Chris Kobach. 20 minutes for this question, right? Yeah. <laughs> now it's 57 seconds. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, look, obviously there's so much uh, that a state can do. Uh, sure, the federal government does have uh, the principal role, but as I've argued in cases that have gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has acknowledged, states can do lots of things to discourage illegal immigration. Giving them in-state tuition is not one thing that we should be doing. We need to cut, stop doing that. We're also spending $377 million a year of taxpayer money in giving welfare and other public benefits to illegal aliens. We also have three sanctuary counties. Johnson County used to be one, but thankfully the new sheriff got rid of that. I proposed a bill, or drafted a bill, that made it through committee but never got to a final vote to end sanctuary counties in Kansas. And you can do it really easily. You just take away all state funds. When the county can't feed at the trough, the county changes its policy. We also need to have E-Verify for all state contract recipients. You want to work and use Kansas taxpayer money? To, to have that job, then you better use E-Verify so that all of your workers are U.S. citizens or are here legally. Laura Kell, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Yeah, I think we all understand that uh, we need to have secure borders, but more importantly, we need to have a comprehensive immigration reform, and that can only be done at the federal level. We need to be pressuring our congressional delegation to get their act together and get us the immigration reform that we need. Our agricultural industry depends upon it, our manufacturing uh, industry depends upon it. It's something that must get done and must get done as soon as possible. Greg Ullman. This is yet another area where both parties have failed us. If you look at comprehensive immigration reform in Washington, D.C., it failed in 2007 because the Democrats wanted it to fail. In fact, read the congressional record. Ted Kennedy had forged a compromise with John McCain, and it was Byron Dorgan and two Democrats, Barack Obama and Harry Reid, who torpedoed it with a poison pill amendment. Both parties are to blame for this. Both parties are the reason uh, Kansas's economy is consistently being threatened by, by the loss of so many workers. Chris Kobach. Greg criticizes both parties, but he adopts the policy position of the Democrat Party. And that's typical. And I understand that's where he's positioning himself. But look, he's offering the same pro-amnesty position that Ms. Kelly is offering as well. Amnesty is not something the state can grant anyway, but that approach where you just say, we've got illegal aliens, we're not, we're not, we're just, we're giving up and we're going to accept that. We don't have to accept that. I've advised the president many times on this issue. States can discourage illegal immigration. Missouri is doing it successfully. Their laws are much better structured. Kansas needs to change. According to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, the number of murders in Kansas last year was the highest since the KBI began tracking those statistics back in 1959. What is the single most important action the state of Kansas can take, Mr. Kobach, to reduce homicides? Well, I'm sure there's some criminal attorneys out here who might have a thought or two on that. Look, I mean, there's no silver bullet. There's no magical statute that the state can pass to reduce homicides. Uh, we do have to support law enforcement. And that is, by the way, one area where I think the uh, attrition of numbers and employees should not occur because you have certain ratios that a police department and a highway patrol has to have per population the number of officers. Uh, I don't favor a policy of ratcheting down all of our uh, sentences so that we can simply open up beds uh, in our prisons. We have to be a, a, a law and order state, a state where if you commit the crime, uh, you will do the time. And we, it has a deterrent effect. And, and just to switch to an analogous issue where I've been personally involved, we've been prosecuting voter fraud in Kansas, uh, and it has had a deterrent effect. We, the word got out that if you commit the crime of double voting, uh, we will catch you and you'll probably face a three to $5,000 fine. And, and the, number, the amount of cases of double voting has decreased. So you have to punish crimes like this. Homicide, of course, is at the top of the list. And through punishment, you have deterrence. Thank you. Greg Ullman. You know, I agree there's no silver bullet here. But there's also no question we need top to bottom criminal justice reform. I mean, the reality is we're spending more money now building another prison. Uh, we've got a lot of people in our prisons who are there for offenses uh, that I think don't rise to the level of putting people in prisons, taking them away from their families, creating more dependency on public programs and public welfare programs, and ultimately putting them in a position 
where they can almost no longer be constructive members of society again. So I absolutely think we need top to bottom uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, you know, just using my time to get back to the issue of, of immigration reform, I almost think the idea, Chris, that you think uh, that we need to get rid of all immigrants in Kansas, all illegal immigrants in Kansas, just disqualifies you to be governor. It's clearly a red meat issue for your base, uh, but ultimately it just demonstrates you don't understand how the ag economy works. Laura Kelly. Yeah, I think there are a variety of things that we can do to look at that. You know, first would be to support our local law enforcement folks, give them the tools that they need uh, to fight crime. I think we also have to recognize that uh, we have a, a gun sense policy uh, lack uh, in the state of Kansas, and we really need to address that as we go forward. I also think that we have decimated our mental health reform system or our mental health system uh, so greatly over the past years that people who are in need of help who are stressed, who are danger to themselves, danger to others, uh, are not getting the services they need, and I think we need to fix that. Chris Kobach, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Um, I, I think uh, Greg's statement that you are disqualified for a governor if you want to have the illegal population leave the state and open up jobs for Kansans, if, that, if you think that disqualifies me, I think he's 180 degrees wrong. I'd be the first governor who's actually tried to do something about the problem because there are many, many jobs, many jobs, whether you're talking bricklaying, whether you're talking all, all kinds of sectors where Americans are making less money. And that's one of the reasons why the Firefighters Union endorsed me. We have to look out for the American worker. Greg Ullman. You know, if you look at the Kansas Works website, they'll say we've got 50,000 job openings and 50,000 unemployed Kansans. I don't, I'm not sure where all these while well, these jobs are coming from, but I want to get back to something Senator Kelly said about needing a gun sense policy here. You know, Senator Kelly said that at another event the other day, and it really rubbed me the wrong way. She talked about getting guns off of college campuses. We only have them because she co-sponsored the constitutional carry amendment in Kansas that put them there. You can't take credit for solving a problem that you created. Laura Kelly, you get the last word. Yeah, thanks. I, two years ago, I voted to take guns uh, off campus. Uh, last year, I voted to take guns away from people who uh, had domestic violence uh, uh, violation, domestic violence violations. And then I also uh, voted to eliminate guns in our public hospitals like KU and mental health centers. Uh, you know, you can, you can make a vote and then realize that it's gone too far and make some changes, and I'm doing that. And Moms Demand Action have recognized me as a gun sense candidate. Thank candidate. you very much. We learned this week that shoppers are spending more freely, business confidence is soaring, unemployment is near an 18-year low, and the stock market going through the roof. But what about those who are struggling to meet their basic needs? How would your governorship help them, Greg Orman? Well, you know, we have a detailed economic development plan that, among other things, focuses on workforce development. 99% of all the new jobs created post-recession require some level of post-secondary education. And so we've proposed things like a revolving loan fund so that kids can get certificate programs and things like welding. Uh, we've proposed things like a new financing mechanism so that we can build processing capacity for value-added agriculture. We've got a whole series of plans that's focused on workforce development, helping people get better jobs and lift up their life. Laura Kelly. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, there are a number of things that we need to do to, to lift up uh, folks and, and get them the opportunity for good paying jobs. I want to start, though, back. You know, so many times we address the issue at the, of the moment rather than looking at how do we really solve the problem. And that's why, when I'm governor, I will focus very heavily on early childhood education and programs. You know, I'm going to work with our business community and form public-private partnerships all across the state so that we're getting to our kids at a very early age and their families so that by the time they get into our school system, they're not needing our special education programs. By the time they get to their teenage years, they're not going into our juvenile system. And by the time they're in their late high school years and going into college, that they are work ready and able to be productive citizens. Chris Kobach. I want to focus on one specific group, the elderly. There are many Kansans, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Kansans who have retired and have said, okay, 
I can afford to live in my home for the rest of my life. This is the budget I have. This is my social security. This is whatever other savings I had. But they are finding that they are now being taxed out of their own homes. And many of them are in northern Johnson County because appraisals have been killing people who are figuratively killing people who are in a position where they don't have another source of income. They can't somehow increase their income by X percent to account for the 50 percent appraisal increase that happened in a two-year period. If you live in this county, you know what I'm talking about. Big box retail between 2016 and 2017 increased an average of 80, not 18, 80% 80 appraised value in one year. I defy anyone to give me an explanation economically as, that can justify that increase. These appraisals are stealth tax hikes. They are set, and no one has to take responsibility on the county commission. We have to have a 2% cap, which I have proposed, so that no one's appraisal goes up more than 2% any year. Thank you. Greg Olman, 30 seconds to rebut. You, you know, median household income in America hasn't risen since 1999. Think about that for a second. For the average American household, they haven't seen a pay increase in the amount of time it takes a kid to go from being born to graduating from high school. At the same time, the things we spend so much money on, health care, higher education, uh, child care, have all skyrocketed. So for the average American and the average Kansan, it doesn't feel like you're treading water. It feels like you're drowning. And we need to focus on lifting them up through education, primarily technical and professional education. Laura Kelly. Yeah, you know, the, the reason our tax, our property tax, our income taxes are too high right now is a direct result of the Brownback tax experiment of 2012 and 2013. We have reversed that. We need to wait until probably the middle of next year to understand the full implications of what we did. We also need to wait to see what the implications of the federal tax cuts are. But when we figure that all out, those are the areas that we need to look at because, indeed, uh, our property taxes are way too high and our sales Thank tax you very is much. so high it's immoral. Thank you. Mr. Kobach. No, the reason that our taxes are too high is because the legislature voted to raise the taxes. Uh, Ms. Kelly did so in 2009 and 2017 on income taxes and 2010 and 2015 on sales taxes. The legislature bears responsibility for this. You can't just say, oh, they made me do it. No, the legislature and the governor have to step up and stop spending so much. The thing that government can do, the, on the left people talk, oh, the government will have a program that will just create jobs magically. And what the government can actually do is stop taking money out of your pocket. That's something we can do tomorrow. If money is an issue in paying for services in Topeka, two measures have been proposed that would bring hefty amounts of cash into the state's coffers. One is to legalize marijuana, the second is to authorize sports betting, now that a recent federal court ruling paves the way for states to legalize gambling on college and professional games. Would you support, Laura Kelly, either measure, or do you have a better idea? Uh, I, I would support legalization of medical marijuana. I think it's, it's past time uh, for us to do that. I don't think uh, Kansas, uh, in particular the legislature, is ready to go uh, full bore on recreational marijuana. And I also think people need to recognize that is not going to be our budget panacea. You know, the more as states uh, legalize marijuana, the we'll see a significant decrease in revenues provided to the state. So I don't want anybody to get the idea that that's how we're going to fund our schools. It won't happen. Sports betting, I'm fine with. Uh, it'll bring in some revenue. But again, it's not the kind of thing uh, that's going to be able to substitute uh, for a sound tax structure. Chris Kobach. Uh, no on medical marijuana, yes on sports betting. Uh, let's look at medical marijuana first. Uh, look, every state that's tried medical marijuana legalization has found that it becomes a ridiculously open gateway for people to just use it for recreational purposes. Sure, people who need it for medical purposes also get it, uh, but the, the processes for the doctor's note are laughable, and people use it recreationally as well in those states. So no, I don't favor uh, medical marijuana legalization. I do favor doing things to fast track uh, access to the CBD, the, the, the beneficial component of marijuana that actually does provide pain relief, and the FDA is on the verge uh, of approving that in pill form. There are already oil versions of it. So we as a, as a state and as government can certainly try to facilitate access to the medically beneficial component of marijuana, but the notion that, hey, we'll just say it's okay for medical purposes and everything can be solved, uh, simply not, not realistic. Uh, sports betting, uh, we'll see uh, how much revenue it generates. I, I agree with Senator Kelly, it may not generate that much, but certainly uh, it's not something that I think the legislature should prohibit. Greg Ullman. You know, obviously, any doctor who is able to prescribe a Schedule II narcotic should be able to prescribe medical marijuana. I think we've seen things like opioids be far more addictive and far more damaging to our communities 
than medical marijuana would be. And I've seen up close the, the impact of this. I traveled to Colorado recently and saw a young man who had to flee uh, with his mother uh, from Kansas uh, and ultimately got treatment in Colorado, prevented him from having 200 seizures a day, uh, and now he's been seizure-free for 21 weeks. Uh, so I think that's important. In terms, of, in terms of recreational use, I don't believe we should be arresting, booking, uh, trying and incarcerating a teenager for buying a dime bag of weed. Uh, but by the same token, uh, I would treat it as a citable offense the same way we deal with the speeding ticket. You're caught with recreational quantities, uh, you get a ticket. Sports betting, yes. People are going to bet on sports anyway, given what the, the courts have ruled. We might as well get some of the benefit of it. Laura Kelly, 30 seconds to rebut. Uh, yeah, I, when we're talking about uh, legalizing medical marijuana, we're not talking about uh, the approach that was taken in Colorado where it really was available on every corner. Uh, this would be a much more regulated uh, approach where doctors would be doing the prescribing. Uh, but I think we know uh, from our hospice work and from uh, opioid abuse uh, that there's a real use for medical marijuana uh, and one that will actually decrease costs and decrease uh, addiction. Chris Kobach. But of course, the beneficial component of medical marijuana, it will soon be available in pill form and is already available in oil form. So there's no good reason why we send a message. And as the father of five young daughters, and I'm sure many of you are parents or grandparents, you are sending a message when suddenly the thing that was illegal now becomes legal, even if for specified purposes, and that, oh, it's really not that bad, it's okay, go ahead. And I don't want to send that message. I think there's no reason, there's no good excuse to legalize marijuana. Final word to you, Mr. Ullman. You know, I think the, the idea that it's only CBD is actually medically wrong. Uh, I, the, the young man in, in Colorado who's getting treatment today is getting a combination of CBD and THC. Uh, you know, look, this is a humanitarian issue. We shouldn't have people at their most vulnerable feeling like criminals. Uh, we shouldn't have people who are trying to uh, treat the effects of chemotherapy feeling like they're breaking the law just because they want a little relief. What happens on the national political scene can have a ripple effect on what happens locally in our states. Beginning with you, Chris Kobach, which action by the Trump administration do you support the most? Which do you most oppose? Uh, support the most would be the Trump tax cuts. Oppose, hmm, it's a tough one. I suppose I'd, uh, I'd say I, I oppose uh, the, the delay in um, reversing the DACA amnesty that the Obama administration did unconstitutionally through an executive order. Uh, President Trump eventually got there. I just would have gotten there faster. Sorry, I couldn't give you a more uh, vigorous uh, opposition. But look, the Trump tax cut, let's talk about that. Um, that is something that has got the national economy moving. Kansas, however, in 2017 was one of three states that had negative economic growth. The other two were Louisiana and Connecticut. So we have negative growth because of our high taxes. Meanwhile, the rest of the nation is booming. Cutting taxes does have a stimulative effect on the economy. Uh, and then the legislature failed by about five votes to pass on the Trump tax windfall that was created at the state level. If we had mirrored the federal changes, we could have given $137 million total to taxpayers in Kansas. That's going to be one of the first thing I, I ask for as governor is to pass that windfall on to the people of Kansas. Laura Kelly. Uh, thank you. I think, I think the thing that I most abhor about the Trump administration is the divisiveness, the incivility, uh, the xenophobia, the misogyny. Uh, that comes out of that administration on a regular basis. I think it's tearing our country apart, uh, and I think we need a, a uniter, not a divider. Uh, so that, that's what I uh, like the least about the Trump administration. Uh, in terms of, I've been racking my brain here trying to think of what do I like the best. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I suppose maybe uh, putting golf back up at the uh, high level of um, giving it a lot of attention that the sport desperately needed. Greg Ullman. <laughs> Actually, I think it's Tiger Woods' comeback that's done that. Um, you know, look, I, I appreciate his support for apprenticeship programs and his support for technical education. If you look at the OECD, there are 34 countries in it. Only one of them values a technical education as much as an academic one, and it's Germany. And it's no surprise they have a $300 billion trade surplus 
an almost a $70 billion trade surplus with the United States. I think we need to do more to allow kids to have pathways into those technical programs. I actually call it professional education because I think if you're a plumber, you're a welder, you're a professional in my mind. Uh, in terms of the things that, that most concern me, you know, as a Kansan, I'm concerned about his approach on tariffs. Uh, you know, ultimately, I understand the strategy, but I think it's a very risky approach. Uh, and if we end up in a real trade war with someone like China, it might prevent the supply chains that we've built from being used and ultimately lead to a devastation again uh, for our ag economy, and that concerns me. Chris Kobach, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Yeah, I want to continue along the line of the uh, passing along the windfall of the Trump tax cut. It would be $137 million, and Senator Kelly can perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she voted against returning that windfall to the people of Kansas. So that was essentially a windfall for the state. The, the state budget suddenly got this $137 million that it should have passed along to the people of Kansas if our code mirrored the change in the federal code. But instead, she and other legislators, and please correct me if I'm wrong, kept the windfall instead of returning it to you. That's what's wrong with Topeka. You have that opportunity now, Ms. Kelly. Uh, th thank you. You know, I uh, railed against the, the uh, Brownback tax experiment of 2012 and 13. So I was not going to do the same thing uh, in 2017 uh, and cut taxes uh, when our state was in such a world of hurt. Greg Ullman. You know, and, and, and look, we've got so many problems we need to deal with. We've got an $8 billion pension deficit. Uh, we've got all sorts of issues that we have to deal with with the state of Kansas. I think we need to be uh, fiscally prudent about it. There's no question about it. The Associated Press reports that Kansas lawmakers are now vowing to take a fresh look at the state's election laws after the recent primary brought with it long lines in some places, even longer delays in getting the results and different ways of handling ballots depending on where you live. Do you support, Mr. Orman, any change to Kansas election law? Well, you know, look, I've talked about this at length. I think all the election laws that we have are built to support the Democratic and the Republican Party. As an example, we had to go through a detailed process to get over 10,000 signatures to get on the ballot. You know, Democrats and Republicans actually just to get, get to fill out a form and pay a, pay a fee. I'd like to see a primary for independence. I'd like to see ranked choice voting so that we can go ahead and allow people to rank their preferences. I think it would ultimately lead to more civil discourse as people sought second place votes. Uh, and I think it would take away this process where we feel like we have to vote for the lesser of two evils. You know, so many independents that I talk to when they go to vote, they feel like they're being forced to choose between the shingles and the flu. Uh, you know, I think we need a system that gives them positive choices. Chris Kobach. Um, no, I, I've, I've worked for the past eight years to bring us the strongest election security measures in the country. And if you ask any Secretary of State, they would say, yeah, Kansas has the strongest election security measures. It's, it's good to be number one. Uh, and I think we are now, I know we are now a model for other states. Alabama has adopted our proof of citizenship law word for word. Pennsylvania has adopted portions of our protection for absentee ballots. Other states are looking at prosecutorial authority for the Attorney General and Secretary of State like we have here in Kansas. Uh, we have achieved something great in Kansas. So I imagine that uh, my colleague on the stage here uh, from the Democrat Party would disagree here. But look, there is a real, there was a real problem with non-citizens getting on the ballot, uh, getting on the, uh, the registration rolls in Kansas. We had 127 that we found, and you can't just look at the rolls and say, oh, that's a non-citizen. They were found because they did something else, like declining jury duty and saying, I'm not a U.S. citizen. The actual number is in the thousands. Uh, one expert in the case we had uh, estimated it could be over 30,000. So we have solved these problems. Kansas should be proud of what it has accomplished. Laura Kelly. Yeah, I think actually um, there's been a national group uh, that's looked at Kansas and found us to be about 48th. Uh, in election security, uh, nowhere near the top, very close to the bottom uh, in terms of our actual security. I think there are some measures that we can take that would make voting uh, more accessible uh, to folks and uh, engage our uh, citizens. Uh, and one thing I would propose is that we look at uh, having same-day registration, uh, that on voting day you can go in and you can register to, as a Republican, you can register as a Democrat, you can register as an Independent, and you can vote that day. Uh, the restrictions that we have placed on 
it have made it very, very difficult and disenfranchised all the wrong people. You know, really our senior citizens, many of them in nursing homes, uh, our disabled folks, our veterans. Uh, these are people who have the right uh, and should be encouraged to vote, and we need to make it possible for that to happen. Greg Holman, 30 seconds to rebut. You know, Senator Kelly, I'm a little confused because you voted for the voter ID bill. Uh, so I'm a little confused by your attacking it right now. You know, look, we've got real problems to solve. Uh, we don't need to spend our time solving problems uh, that are fictional, made up, and non-existent. Yes, we need secure elections, but the idea that we had 30,000 people voting illegally in Kansas and we've only prosecuted 10 cases leads me to believe that this is more of a red meat issue and far less of a real problem. And Kansas has real problems we need to focus on. Chris Kobach. Uh, I'd like to correct one error and rebut one point from Ms. Kelly. She said uh, the Southside group found us 48th in security. No, they found us 48th in administration. And if you look at why they found that, they said because Kansas has so many provisional ballots. Why do we have so many provisional ballots? Because our statutes say that if you roll up to the election polling place, no matter what your situation is, you've never lived in Kansas, you've never registered, we hand you a provisional ballot. That's our fail safe in our law. It's, not, it's something that the legislature rightly chose. As far as same day registration, it's been a disaster in states like New Hampshire okay. where people come in from. Thank out of you state very much, Mr. Vote. Kobach. The final word goes to you, Laura Kelly. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, address Greg's issue of, of my vote. Uh, you know, Greg, you weren't there. Uh, if you had been, you would have understood that this was a compromise that was forged because what Secretary Kobach wanted at that point uh, was to put this law in force with no restraints in 2012. Uh, we got it delayed to 2014 with the hope that the uh, Real ID program would be in place uh, and it would not be a burden to our citizens. A new report claims college graduates are now majoring in student loan debt. Students who graduated college last year owed a whopping average of $39,000 a year. What role, if any, Laura Kelly, should the state of Kansas play in making college more affordable? Well, we know that there's a direct correlation between the amount of state support given to our higher education system and the price of tuition. Uh, so we need, as a state, to fulfill our obligation to our higher education institutions and fund them in a way that doesn't force them to rely so heavily on, on tuition. I think the other thing we need to look at uh, is providing paths for students to get through school in three years. We've already started some of that with our career in tech ed by getting down into our high school and allowing kids to get college credits early. They can actually go into a Regents University now with a full year behind them at a much reduced rate, that will save them on tuition. Uh, and then we need to make sure that, that we've got enough programs in place for them that when they get there, they can get the courses they need, get in, get out, and get a job. Mr. Rollman. You know, let's be clear here. Tuition at KU actually rose more on a percentage basis during the prior administration than the Brownback administration. This is a problem that's been going on for a long time. I do believe we need to restore funding to higher education, but then I think we need to say to them, look, you have to engage in the benefit of the bargain. We want to make higher education more affordable for kids. You have to commit to not increasing tuition, books, and fees by more than the rate of inflation in the general economy. If you're willing to agree to that benefit of the bargain, then I think, I think we, can, we can restore funding. The other thing I would say is this is largely a federal issue, and I think the federal government should do the same thing. I think they should say to colleges and universities, if you want Title IV students and the $120 billion that comes with them annually, you have to commit to the same thing, not increasing costs for tuition, books, and fees by more than the rate of inflation in the general economy. Mr. Kobach. Largely a federal issue. State land grant institutions are largely a federal issue. Look, we have a real problem in Kansas. $28,000 is the average debt that a Kansas student has upon graduation. That's just the average. Lots of people are fifty, sixty thousand dollars uh, in debt. And I do agree with uh, Greg, though, on the point that we absolutely have to keep college tuition from increasing. Now, we might take a different approach in doing it. It has been going way faster than inflation. It's it's outrageous uh, how people are being encouraged uh, to get into college as quickly as possible right away and not looking at other alternatives and usually to go straight to the four-year university, and then they are saddled with this debt for the rest of their lives. Uh, one of the solutions, well, first of all, the governor does control, of course, uh, uh, membership on the Board of Regents, and absolutely, I'll be putting people on the Board of Regents whose number one priority is keeping tuition down. 
number one. Second thing is well, there are innovative approaches that are out there now that I think we'll be pushing for. One is allowing people to get college credit during their senior year in high school, then go to a community college at a very reasonable cost for one or two years, and then spending one or two years at the university. And the Board of Regents has Thank started looking so at much, that. Thank you so much, Mr. Kobach. Ms. Kelly. Yeah, I think that um, you know we're all interested in making sure that uh, higher education is affordable for our kids. I think we also need to emphasize and maybe move this into our high schools that not every kid needs to be going to a four-year school, that there are a lot of programs in our career and tech ed programs that will allow those kids to gain a skill and come out having a good paying job and a, and a fulfilling career. So I think that I want to put a lot more emphasis on that as we're moving along and uh, fixing our education system. Mr. Rollman, 30 seconds to rebut. You know, the, the value of, of college education and a four-year degree is still a positive one from a net present value standpoint. The real risk here and the real issue is that kid who goes for two or three years then leaves without a degree and in debt. And I think we also need uh, to ask our Board of Regents to focus on graduation rates and what we've seen and, and talking to them, if we reach the graduation rate targets that they've set, it's not only good for those kids, but it's great for our economy. Mr. Kobach, we have a question here about U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who recently said there is too much suppression of free and open speech on college campuses today. Do you believe this is an issue in Kansas, and if so, how should the state respond? Uh, it absolutely is an issue in Kansas. This is an issue everywhere in higher education, and I'm speaking, of course, as I think the only person on stage who's been actually employed in higher education. I was a law professor for 15 years and have a few students uh, in, the, in the audience, I believe, as well. Um, look, there, there is definitely a culture of very heavy political correctness, both in the undergraduate communities and in the law schools and others. Uh, and it is uh, oppressive at times when people who have a conservative point of view are shouted down, are pushed off, you know, booed off campus, in some cases in California, violently uh, forced not to have conservative speakers. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone can reasonably doubt uh, that proposition, either by me or by uh, Jeff Sessions, or, or dispute that proposition. That is not your time. <laughs> that is the hotel. You please proceed if you give extra <laughs> a bit of time to Mr. Kobach as he completes his thought, timekeepers. Let me get my, tra my train of thought back on the track here. Um, the, uh, so, so absolutely, the governor can do things. And I think an example was, of course, when uh, KU was flying the desecrated flag. I realized they were calling it art, but, you know, come on. Uh, it wasn't. That was a perfect example of where students initially led the protest and say, hey, something is wrong here. And then the, uh, the, the administ officials like myself said, hey, uh, this should not be there. So we can weigh in. We're going to go next to Mr. Rollman. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a private sector person. I've spent 27 years of my life building and growing businesses. And one of the things that is essential to the problem-solving process, in my mind, is intellectual conflict. Uh, it's the way we get to the best answers. It's why an Orman administration will have people in it who have different ideologies, They'll have people from different parties because ultimately I think intellectual conflict's a good thing. I don't think we should be suppressing free speech. I understand that in many cases people say things that make others blood boil. But the reality is the foundation of our country is built on a constitution and a bill of rights. And the first bill of rights, the, um, the first one allows us that freedom of speech. And I don't think it should be impaired. Ms. Kelly. Yeah, I, I can't um, say how much I support the freedom of speech. I think it's very, very important uh, that we allow that. And I think it's particularly important on our university campuses. We, you know, we send our kids to college to grow and to learn uh, and to express themselves and to hear the opinions of others. So uh, I would not want to see us put any restrictions on that, particularly on our college campuses. I would say that I'd like to return some civility to speech. I think that would be very helpful so that we could actually hear one another uh, rather than just shout and yell at one another. Well, and finally, I know we have a battle round. However, we are coming short on this debate. Finally, the sponsors of this debate gave each of our candidates an opportunity for 30 seconds to make their final case to you. And that first candidate statement goes to Mr. Orman. Uh, thank you for having me here today. You know, I believe what happens over the next five years in Kansas is going to be determine the path our state is on for the next several decades. Kansas has two options in November. We can lead again and get back on the right track, or we can, can continue with the status quo. 
If you want the status quo, you've got two pretty good choices here. But if you want someone who can get us back on track, who's successfully run, managed, turned around large organizations, then I'm your candidate for governor, and I would appreciate your vote in November. Thank you. Mr. Kobach. Uh, look, you, you judge a politician not by his or her words, but by his or her actions. And I have delivered big changes as Secretary of State, and I will deliver big changes uh, as governor. Uh, Mr. Orman says that uh, if you want the status quo, look at us. I, on the contrary, I'd say if you want the status quo, you've got two tax and spend liberals here to choose from. If you want someone who's going to move us in a radically different direction and actually take Kansas so that we, our taxes are fair again, and so we're no longer the sanctuary state of the Midwest, then you should vote for the candidate of change. And I humbly ask for your vote. Ms. Kelly. Yeah, I think it's time that we slam the door once and for all on the past uh, eight years uh, of misery in the state of Kansas. Uh, and I fully believe that what Kansas needs now is not a showboat. What Kansas needs now is a strong, steady, experienced leader who knows where the problems are and has the relationships already established within the legislature to bring people together and get things done and fix our state. We're on the road to recovery. We don't need to take a U-turn. One of these three people will be the next governor of Kansas. Which one? Only you will decide with your vote. You've been watching the Kansas governor's debate from the main ballroom of the Doubletree Hotel in Overland Park from the entire production crew of KCPT and our debate sponsors, the Johnson County Bar Association. Thank you and goodbye. The Kansas Governor's Debate on KCPT has been presented by the Johnson County Bar Association. 1,400 attorney members serving the community since 1938.